before we get started, uh, Kathy Alexander will be here for you next week. My other activities are not the final vacation of the year. It seems like I've been on vacation a lot, but it's just that they all fell at the end of the year because we didn't do anything at the beginning of the year. So uh, Kathy will be here next week. If you need me, I'm always available by phone. And we're James you need to call the church office. Um, let's see. Zoom, we hope it's good, but patience is your fingers and fall out. We hope it all will be good today. And we have to remember yeah. to talk to our microphone, or else you guys can't hear me. So, um, and then we're That's hoping here. the end of November, the beginning of December, of having a congregational meeting. Um, depending on what the numbers are, we'll either try to have some of it or you know we'll have Zoom as an option also. But as we write goals for the coming year and with everything going on, um, I think it's important that we all kind of gather um, to talk about that. And then just remember Bible study on Wednesday is a news, and then on Tuesday is a 6 30 evening. We are still doing Bible study. So we hope you will join us for those. And Deb's here from Pepe is here. <laughs> Okay, yeah. um, but with that, let's ready our hearts for worship and greetings to play our praise. Amen. Well, that might have to let people in, see. Before I start, I'm fine here. I'm not Of course, we are going to have social distancing, masks, and limited seating. We don't think we will have more than 20, 25 people in the, in the sanctuary. So if you um, really want to come, let me know. So that, uh, tell me now so we can count people how many are going to be here. And what's the date again? October 25th at 5 p.m. Thank you. Oh, two things. Someone made the things in there a little bit. Um, the friends. The first one is uh, Polonaise by uh, German Sebastian Bach, German composer, very famous. And the second is uh, Humoresque, and that means humor piece by Anthony Mozart, uh, Czech composer.
Hey, I need you to mute. Sarah, we need you to mute, please. Yeah, if everybody on Zoom can make sure that they're muted, that would be great. Please stand if you are able. We gather today in the name of Trinity, Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer, and all God's people said, Amen. Lord, you come into our darkness to 
darkness of old superstitions and dogmas that refuse to fade away easily. The darkness of pride and half-truths that masquerade as wisdom. The darkness of entrenched evil that takes the light and tries to dispose of it. The darkness of apathy that cannot be bothered to open the shutters. Let us make our confession together. Most holy and most loving God, we admit to you and to each other that we are creatures who either through foolishness or willfulness have chosen darkness instead of light. Here and now we surrender to you our fears and our proud opinions, our short-sighted folly and our pompous wisdom, our deep-seated sins and our apathy towards change and renewal. Please forgive the darkness and the pain that we have inflicted on others and restore the life star hope and ideals within our soul. Trusting your grace, we earnestly pray, create in us a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within us. And all God's people said, Amen. My friends, the light comes not to steer or to blind us, but to save us. Jesus Christ came into this world to save sinners, and in his name I declare to you, your sins are forgiven.
Our scripture this reading is from Philippians, the fourth chapter. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in every by, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. Yes. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. And God's peace will be with you. Amen. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. These words written by the Apostle Paul, you might try to call them the theme for the letters to the Philippians. For Paul, it's really simple. As Christians, we have no reason not to rejoice. Amen. Now, for those of us who have had a really long week, you might be thinking, well, Paul, let me tell you about my week, and then you can tell me to rejoice. But see, what's so amazing about what Paul wrote is Paul wrote these words about rejoicing while he was in prison. Amen. See, despite the fact that Paul was persecuted for his faith, despite the fact that he was in prison multiple times, despite the fact that he was facing death at the hands of Nero, to him, knowing Jesus Christ and being able to call him Lord was all he needed to start rejoicing. Thank you, Lord. Now, maybe you're saying Paul was one of those crazy optimistic people. You know the kind of talk about time to turn everything on their head and try to make you see the bright side of everything. Somehow I don't think so. Again, remember Paul was the one who in Acts ordered Stephen to be stoned. Somehow I don't think that he was the type of guy who was all smiles and good thoughts. At least not until he met Jesus Christ. And believe it or not, despite all that's going on in our world today, despite the craziness in our leadership right now, at least we can be here worshiping the dead. Yes. Under Nero, the emperor of Rome, Christians were burned and used as torches at his banquets. He threw Christians to the lions for entertainment. Now, I'm not saying we should be frustrated with all the things going on in the world right now. But as Paul says, we have to remember all the reasons we have to rejoice. We have to trust and we have to believe that God can make even the darkest moments. He can take those and turn those into good. Yes. In fact, if you read our scripture closely today, you will see that God has a way, kind of a secret weapon, although it's not really secret. So maybe I should say God has a truth. That if put into practice could change this entire world. Amen. This truth is found in Paul's words. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable. If there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think on these things. Sounds simple, doesn't it? And let me be clear, I'm not saying that we should all just think positively. Simply thinking positively and putting a good spin on all the crap that is going on in our world right now doesn't change anything. Yeah. What Paul is talking about when he writes these words is what Paul's life actually gives witness to. The power and the importance of staying connected to Jesus Christ. See, Paul, because of his faith and his love of Jesus Christ, was able to be out in the world doing all the things God needed him to do. He was able to speak and preach what he needed to be said. He could face all kinds of hardships and trials, and yet he was still able to rejoice. 
Paul wasn't just spreading a message of positive thinking, he was teaching us about the power of staying focused on Jesus, despite all that's going on in the world. Amen. So what about us? Are we so full of joy this morning that we're ready to rejoice? Yeah. <laughs> Some of those that maybe aren't feeling it, I want to ask, I want you to ask yourself, what is holding you back? Can you name it? A recent study listed the top, top five obstacles that keep Christians stuck. Keep us from growing in our faith and keep us from having the faith that sets the world on fire. And those five obstacles are addiction. Mm. Addiction keeps us growing in, from, in God because that addiction becomes our God. It becomes the focus for everything. The second is depression. Amen. Depression is another obstacle because it leaves us just feeling hopeless. And that hopelessness changes our thoughts from, we got this, let's do it, to why bother? What can one person do? Then shame is yet another obstacle. Shame is the belief that we aren't good enough. We think, what do I have to talk about? And then there is unforgiveness and resentment. Because how can we find freedom in Christ when we refuse to let go of the past? And then there's the number one obstacle, and that's fear. Amen. Fear manifests itself in two ways. The first being anxiety, which paralyzes us as we think of all the things that could go wrong, of all the things that might happen. And then the other way fear plays out is this need to control everything. We need to control every aspect of our life. We need to control every aspect of everybody else's life. And we need to even try to control God. And fear and God just don't go very well together. It's not well in one. You can't grow in God if you do not trust in God. Amen. So how do we get so full of all this fear? How do we get so depressed? How do we get so angry? Well, see, what happens is every day, all day, the world gives us all kinds of messages. From family and friends to social media to TV to the news, from our phones, just all kinds of messages. And it starts at our birth. So think of how many messages we have had over our life. And we get to pick up these messages about what we should look like so we don't, Amen. about how we should act so we don't. Amen. We hear messages about what we should be doing what we should be buying, and their messages about who's doing amazing things, and messages about who's doing all these terrible things. Amen. We have thousands of messages going through our brain all the time. And those messages begin to have an effect on our brain to the point where we're no longer able to think about things that are good and things that are pleasing, about the things God wants us to focus on. How many of us right now can even imagine what it would be like to live the type of life that Paul is talking about? A life where we are able to rejoice at all things, to live with the freedom that God wants for us. Take a minute and imagine for a moment life with burdens like shame and Imagine for a moment a life where we don't live in constant doubt, where all fear is gone. No more imagining the worst case scenario. No more thinking about your addiction. No more trying to control everything. Instead, imagine for a moment being set free from all of that. Can you even imagine yourself to be at peace? Can you imagine living with a calmness, even with everything else around you? Is telling you to react and go crazy. Can you imagine yourself as the center of calmness in the midst of this crazy world? Or if you're struggling with depression, can you imagine what it would look like to be full of hope, 
Can you imagine what it would look like to be looking forward to the day? Can you imagine about not worrying, not trying to hold everything together? Now, I'm guessing that most of us, as we try to imagine, we have a great deal of pushback from our brain. Maybe as you try to imagine something new, your brain says something along the lines of, this is stupid. Or, what does any of this have to do with God? And that is exactly my point. Most of us let our thoughts that come from our brain control us. We trust the thoughts that come from our brain. If they tell us something is stupid, we believe it's stupid, and then we don't do it, at least not willingly. Instead of remembering that we actually have power over our brain, we begin to believe our brain is to what our brain is telling us is true. And the scary thing is for Christians, that's really where our faith lies, what we believe to be true. Yeah. So what happens if God gives us a new thought? Or Paul tells us to think of things that are excellent and commendable. And we can't do it. Or at least we find it really hard. How many of us know that God actually designed our brains for us to control? Yeah. That we get to control our thoughts. Did you know that? Yeah. So humor me for a minute. Just think in your mind for a minute. The picture of a cute little baby animal. You see this little baby animal you've ever seen. Maybe it's a puppy or a goat. Little goats, they're adorable. Or a hedgehog. Just think about the cutest animal you've ever seen. Got it in your mind? Now, picture that that cute little animal has pink fur. Can you do it? Now, picture that cute little animal has polka dots on it. Got it in your mind? Now picture that animal has a banana for a nose. Got it? See? We can't control our thoughts, can we? Good job, guys. See, God knows that we can control our thoughts, and that's what he wants us to do. Our mind is a really powerful tool. That's why we hear in Romans 12 that we are not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind and faith. How do we have faith in God if we don't control our thoughts? Hebrews 11 tells us that faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. If we do not learn to control our minds, we will never be free. A few months ago, a friend of mine called me to tell me that her daughter was pregnant. Should be a happy time, right? Well, for her it wasn't. My friend's daughter has been struggling for a number of years with some mental health issues and holding back a job and having some really bad boyfriends. Her latest boyfriend had gotten her pregnant, and my friend, although she hated thinking about it, she said she almost found herself just wishing her daughter would have an abortion. All she could think about is all the things that could go wrong. She had already planned out this child's life until it was 20. All she felt was this extra burden that now she would have to help take care of this child. She couldn't even imagine that this child might bring her any joy or any happiness or any hope. That maybe this child was a gift from God and a reason to rejoice. Instead, all she felt was fear and anxiety and hopelessness. Now again, I'm not saying that she should stick her head in the sand and pretend that her daughter is ready for a child, or that this is exactly what she would have liked to happen. But see, what Paul urges us to do is that in all things we are to trust that God is still in control of this world, and that God is at work, and that God intends to bless us and have us be a blessing to others. Our attitude, our fear, it all affects the outcomes and all the things that we see going on around us. So much of our life is determined by the thoughts that this world has put into our head. 
And yes, some of those things in our head are excellent and pleasing, but some of the things in our head are just horrible and wrong. Yeah. And we let those horrible and wrong things define us. Tell us who we are. Tell us how to feel. We give our brain that authority. And so we get stuck. And we can't even imagine a life that is any different. But Jesus says, I did not give you a spirit of fear. Yeah. And God said, I created you and said you were good. Yeah. He says, I told you to boast in your suffering, not try to cover it or hide it. Yeah. Because those sufferings, as it said in Romans, will produce endurance, and endurance will produce character, and character will produce hope. Yeah. And hope will not disappear. We heard this week in the our Bible study on Jeremiah on Tuesday night that God wrote his law and his blood for us on each one of our hearts. Yeah. We all know God. Every person born knows God. We just let so many messages from the world cover that up. We let it cover up all our joy and all our peace and all the love that God has written there. Choose. Do we have, choose to have faith in the messages of this world? Or do we choose to have faith in God? If we choose faith in God, then let the messages of God replace those messages that we get from the world. Train your brain. Talk back to that brain of yours. And then sit back and watch what happens to your life. Let's really just close your eyes for one minute. Tell your brain it's okay. Just close your eyes. And imagine for a moment this world as God created it to be. Imagine the beauty of creation, a sunset or a sunrise, the vastness of the ocean, a tall, magnificent tree, Imagine the peace of a dark winter's night, or the quiet and the stillness right before dawn. Imagine the joy as you hold a brand new puppy as it squirms and wiggles to get out of your arms. Imagine the hug of a good friend, or to find out like a stranger. How does it make you feel? This week, keep thinking about the things that are pleasing and are good. And let God be with you and fill your heart with joy. And so you can rejoice. Yeah. Amen. So Pastor asked you to do a solo after the sermon that matched. And my goodness, you're not kidding. The lyrics are perfect. I wonder if I would have figured this out listening as I often do. <laughs> this is my favorite song of all time. Uh, as it turns out, I'm a jazz man, but I love this song. It's by John Lennon. Uh, he left us with this sermon and then he went on. So this is for you. Thank you. Yeah. Imagine all the 